Uh, so Siobhan Moore, as you've heard, I'm a reader in One Health at the University of Liverpool in the UK. Um, but I've been based at Ilri, Ethiopia since 2018, and uh, I'm a principal scientist there and the, lead, well, the country lead, uh, coordinator for Ethiopia and also for Somalia uh, in the COHESA project. But today I'm going to talk to you about the HEAL project, which I would usually say is one of the very rare examples of bottom-up approaches to One Health uh, that is very applied and about operationalizing One Health. But actually in this session, uh, you're seeing some really great examples uh, of just that. So uh, hopefully this will take it in a new direction. So for us, uh, we're situated in the Horn of Africa. So much of the challenges that we are hearing about with rangelands uh, exist in that um, particular setting as well. You'll be familiar with the livelihood dependent livestock um, strategy of, sorry, the livestock dependent livelihood strategy of, of pastoralists in this region and the uh, environmental degradation that occurs um, due to climate change, due to heavy rotational um, grazing or disorganized grazing. And the particular area where we're focusing on as a project is in the lower right-hand side. So this poor access to services. So these are pastoralists who access rangelands uh, that are in very remote areas. And what that tends to mean is that they don't have quality uh, services that they can access, be they human or livestock or natural resource management uh, areas. And so that's where HEAL uh, has set its heart um, to try to improve that particular situation using a One Health approach. So our aim, as I say, is really around trying to improve access to quality uh, human and veterinary services and sustainable natural rangeland management practices. We're operating in pastoralist areas of Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. And it's a really um, One Health project by design. It's led by VSF Swiss, which is a, a veterinary NGO. Uh, so they are the animal health lead. We have a public health NGO, AMREF, um, who is the, the human health lead. And then we have us, ILRI, uh, who is the rangeland health lead, as well as the teaching and training and, re and research lead. And so here is the point where I tell you I'm the PI at ILRI, um, but I am a vet by background, and my subsequent life was as a public health uh, practitioner. I did my PhD on childhood diarrhea. And here I am leading a project where our main uh, component is on the rangeland health side. Um, and so really my role in this project is to help to be a knowledge intermediary and think about how can we apply this disciplinary way of thinking around rangeland health and incorporate that into an initiative that's really around the integration of human, animal, uh, natural resource management services. So how are we doing this? Our main model is to establish what we call One Health units. So what we're trying to do there is to promote the integration of services on, uh, across sectors between human, animal health, and environmental health sectors. And you can see on the figure um, what that constitutes. So we would have different frontline service providers as well as community-based uh, sectors, uh, um, community-based actors representing the different sectors. And then depending on the context, uh, and this is something that's largely determined by the communities themselves, our mobile, uh, our One Health units might be mobile, meaning that they move alongside uh, the livestock groups together uh, as a, as a multi-sectoral team, and they would do that according to an agreed schedule with the, the communities themselves. Or they might work from a common point, so that might be a common water source, or it might actually be a, a common clinic where the human, animal, and environment sectors are working together. And I want to really stress that these are still government-employed practitioners who we are, as a project, supporting to mobilize together. So our role is to really help facilitate that integration of those um, disciplinary ways of, of, of providing services. The, the entire model is then overseen by communities and the government themselves. So on the right-hand side, we have the MSIPs. So these are multi-stakeholder innovation platforms, which are effectively a way to mobilize communities to discuss human, animal, environment problems, think about the kinds of solutions that they would be able to um, uh, support, and then that information would be uh, shared with the government, the One Health Task Force at the county level, uh, and together, they're providing oversight over then the mobilization of these One Health units. So it's a very integrated model. 
And then we have our partners. There are NGO partners who are out in the fields and will be helping to mobilize uh, these different platforms at the government, community, and, and service provider levels. But our aim, of course, is that at some point the NGO partners will not be there and that we will have set up a, a framework and a way of working at the community level, at the service provider level, and at the, the government level that ensures that they continue to mobilize themselves in this more integrated way to provide services. So I've used this word services many times, and I think uh, most of the people in the room, or usually most of the people in the room in a One Health Congress are still you know, veterinarian by background, maybe public health subsequently, and I think we can all really easily conceptualize what we mean by human and animal services, right? Vaccinations, treatments, those sorts of things. It's quite easy um, to articulate. The environment, on the other hand, trying to think about the kinds of services to provide in that space are a little bit harder to articulate, and we've had to do a lot of work as a project to think about what that can actually look like. And so for us, the environment throws up, shows up in three ways. We've got rangeland health on the left side, which I'm going to come back to, environmental health, which I'm going to come back to, and then down at the bottom, what we call the CBON. And I won't talk too much about that, but just to say that that's the community-based observation network, which is really around trying to support communities to collect uh, weather information and incorporate that and interpret that in light of their traditional knowledge as well. Um, so they've got different types of ways to make decisions about uh, the types of activities that they pursue. Starting with the first present today, presentation today, there were some definitions presented, and we've talked a lot about different definitions. I think I'm the first person to put up a definition of environmental health, <laughs> strangely, given the nature of the conference. Um, and we were really careful to do this because environmental health as a term uh, is understood so differently by different disciplines. Actually, the Oxford Dictionary uh, defines it as a, pub a branch of public health and very much concerned with monitoring and mitigating factors in the environment that affect human health and disease, which isn't a very One Health perspective at all. So what we do is expand that definition in our SOP to say that it's also considering the impacts of the environment on animal health, and, and I've got some examples there. And that's quite different to the concept of rangeland health, which we also need to understand, which is around the degree to which uh, the soil, vegetation, water and air um, and, and these ecological processes are intact and balanced and sustained. So in many ways, environmental health and ecosystem health are somewhat opposite of each other. One is looking at the environment impact on humans and animals. The other one is very much thinking about what does the environment provide for humans and then thinking about the consequences of humans back onto that ecosystem um, sort of approach. And so for us, it also very much registers that the rangeland is fundamental to the livelihoods and, and feed base of uh, pastoralist systems. So why do we need rangeland expertise in One Health? And I think that's the whole question around this um, session. So I, I wanted to put that question to you. I want you to identify which rangeland is healthy. So raise your hand if you think A is healthy. Raise your hand if you think B is healthy. Raise your hand if you think C is healthy. <laughs> okay. So that proved my point, that we are very poor at being able to assess uh, rangeland ecosystem health, because in fact these are all healthy rangelands. They're uh, taken in different sites in, in semi-arid conditions, uh, it might be in the dry season as opposed to the wet season, uh, it might be after fire management. But as you know, veterinary professionals, as public health professionals, we think about diagnosing problems and we can't actually diagnose a problem here because this is a healthy situation. Which prompted me then to uh, dig more around what my rangeland colleagues, how they diagnose problems. What are the problems that they see in the context of rangelands? When can they identify it's not healthy? And so uh, we heard earlier about this idea of forage and, and um, you know, the balance between shrubs and, and grass. And really in a, in a healthy ecosystem that would be in a, in a good balance. So just as an example, 70% grass species, 30% shrub species. And when those sorts of things start to become imbalanced, you can start to see unhealthy ecosystems. 
So we've got bush encroachment on the left. I think that's a very familiar picture. You can definitely, even driving out here, I can now identify bush encroachment um, because you're seeing so much more shrubbery than might otherwise be expected. We've got uh, invasive prosopis on, on the, in the middle, um, which creates problems for livestock. You can see here it's creating problems for accessing to water, but it's also toxic species. And on the right, we've got uh, an example of severe erosion and gullies. So I think, again, we probably have some sense for these sorts of problems. But then for us as, as veterinarians, public health professionals, how, where do you start to solve these sorts of problems? The good news is, is also that rangeland health specialists have tools for dealing with these problems. So in our project, we are using an approach called participatory rangeland management, which really helps to guide communities through a process of investigating problems, planning, and implementing sustainable resource management uh, within their local context. So very much about their local context and about community uh, capacity to improve the way that they manage their land. So different tools that they might have at their disposal are things like um, seasonal grazing and, and um, uh, spelling, but more importantly, um, trying to support communities to maybe introduce things like bylaws, which could then help um, the way in which they can regulate the use of the land in that way. Alternatively, there might be rangeland restoration techniques, so things like invasive species control, bush thinning, and, and prescribed uh, fire, are just being examples of the ways in which we might try to rehabilitate uh, landscapes in these areas on a small scale. But it has really not been easy, and I think that's really important to stress, that when we talk about these disciplines, of course, I think we all recognise soil, plant health, all of these things are important for health, but it's a lot harder to then think about how do we operationalise that knowledge and integrate this. So this is spoken from the HEALS perspective, but I suspect it will resonate for a lot of other projects as well. So why do we struggle with this? Human and animal services, I mean, we design them like this. They're designed around a local government area, right, an administrative boundary. Landscapes ignore those boundaries, right? They transcend boundaries. They might cross into new areas where you're not working necessarily. So if you're trying to influence the, the integrity of the ecosystem itself, you need to be operating at a larger scale. When we governance, uh, when we talk about human and animal governance, it's pretty identifiable. We have ministries, we have service providers and community-based actors on the human and animal side that we can quite easily identify for each of those um, different sectors. When it comes to the environment, there might be multiple ministries who have some say about the environment. Uh, in Ethiopia alone, we've got the Empi Environmental Protection Authority, we've got the Ministry of Irrigation and Lowlands, we've got the Ministry of Water and Energy. So all of those things have a say in this space of, of environmental governance. Service providers in this environmental health space Again, a little bit hard to identify. More often, they might be development agents with NRM expertise sitting in the Ministry of Agriculture, or they might be environmental health officers sitting in the, the Ministry of Health. And we don't really have the community equivalent of a community animal health worker or a community uh, health worker. Community members themselves, when we try to engage community members, again, uh, you know, defining community is another whole other <laughs> session. Um, but again, when we're talking about rangeland ecosystems, we, we need to think about uh, those uh, communities that are operating across that ecosystem and, and mobile and, and integrating across and engaging the traditional knowledge that exists at community level in rangeland management institutions across those environments. So we don't have really good spatial and temporal overlap between human, animal and environmental health in these kinds of uh, settings. We have very different uh, governance structures and, and therefore we have different entry points about who we might try to engage in these kinds of uh, interventions. And really I think when we talk about the different sectors, we all have very different um, frameworks for thinking about how we would integrate the environment into our initiatives. Last slide, sorry. <laughs> Um, so what are we doing to address this in HEAL? Um, as I said, we've really placed a, a strong emphasis on uh, an SOP which helps to everyone understand what we're doing, how we work together, and that helps to bring everyone onto the same page. 
uh, with definitions on environmental health, integration, what do we mean by integrated services and so forth. We are also piloting the idea of um, community rangeland workers. Um, so they might have various roles. Some of the early ones we've identified are things like invasive species removal and, and really raising community awareness around invasive and toxic species. And of course, when you introduce these new ideas, sustainability is always a question. Uh, but the idea will be that they're also supported to set up a community nursery, which would then help to support their uh, income. We've started to move away a little bit from participatory rangeland management, which is a really long-term process, and try to come up with something like um, invasive species removal at a local level, because that better meets this idea of you know, vaccines or curative treatment, which is a very short-term kind of intervention. So we needed that um, shift into a, a shorter-term kind of um, way of thinking. And the final point I really want to make uh, is that this is really opening my eyes to understanding the pressures we put on the environment sector to somehow improve um, the conditions of, of what we, I think, widely recognise as a, as a deteriorating environmental condition. So when we, um, when we design One Health projects, I think we all need to really think about the fact that it has taken decades and decades of damage to reach this point, and we can't expect that that kind of damage can be undone uh, just as simply as we might do by giving an antibiotic treatment to a child with, uh, you know, a specific infection. So it's a very different approach. Okay, thank you.